Hello and welcome to WZEN's Christmas Stories presentation on OPN. This video is a collection of Christmas stories, poems, songs, and personal thoughts from our friends and family at OPN. It was truly a joy making this and working with each and every person who contributed to the making of this video. No matter how big or how small, how simple or how extravagant, each entry is special and meaningful, and I want to thank you for sharing your time and stories with me and all of our viewers. And this is my gift to you. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Good morning, everybody. I wanted to read this story, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, by Dr. Seuss, because it brings back fond memories with uh, both of my children. We watched it every year, and obviously we've watched it a few times on disc. So here we go. How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Dr. Seuss. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be that his head wasn't screwed on quite right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that most likely the reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve, hating the who's, staring down at, from his cave with a, with a sour, grinchy frown at the harm, warm, lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every who down in Whoville beneath was very busy now hanging this toe wreath. And now they're hanging their stockings and snarled with a smear. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his grinch fingers, nervously drumming, I must find a way to keep Christmas from coming. For tomorrow, he knew, all the little who girls and boys would wake up bright and early. They'd rush for their toys. And then the noise, oh, the noise, 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 noise. And the one thing he hated, the noise, noise, noise. Then the who's young and old would sit down to a feast. And they'd feast and they'd feast and they'd feast and they'd feast. They would start on who pudding and the rare who roast beef, which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then they'd do something he liked least of all. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand and the who's would start singing. They'd sing and they'd sing and they'd sing and they'd sing. And the more the Grinch thought of the Who's Christmas thing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I've put up with it now. I must stop Christmas from coming, but how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I just know what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat. He made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he chuckled and clucked, and what a great crunchy trick. With this coat and this hat, I'll look just like St. Nick. And all I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around. But since reindeer are scarce, there were none to be found. Did that Grinch, the old Grinch? No, the Grinch simply said. If I can find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog Max. Then he took some red thread. He tied a big horn on top of his head. Then he loaded some bands and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, giddy up, and the sleigh a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark, quiet snow filled the air. All the who's were dreaming sweet dreams without care. When he came to the first house in the square, this, this is stop number one, the old Grinchy Claw says. Then he climbed onto the roof, empty bags in his fist. Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once for a moment or two, and he stuck his hat out of the fireplace flue, where the little who stockings were hung in a roll. These stockings, he grinned, are the first to go. Then he slittered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant. Around the whole room, he took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates, drums. Checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn, and plums. And he stuffed them in a bag. Then the Grinch very nimbly stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimney. Then he slunk in into the ice book and he took the goose feet. He took the goose pudding. He took the roast beef. 
He cleaned out the ice buckets first with a flash. Why, that Grinch even took their last can of food ash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee. And now, grinned the Grinch, Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. And the Grinch grabbed the tree and he started to shove. When he heard a small sound like a coo of a dove, he turned around fast and he saw a small boo, little Cindy Lou Who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this little Who daughter, who had got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? But you know that old Grinch was so smart and so slick. He thought up a lie and thought it up so quick. Why, my little sweet tot, the fake Santa Claus lied. There are, there's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there, then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child, and he patted her head. And he got her a drink and sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou went to bed with her cut, he went to the chimney and stuck the tree up. Then the last thing he took was the log for the fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On the walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And one speck of food he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other whose houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other whose mouses. It was a quarter past dawn, all the who's still in bed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled. He packed up their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimming, the trappings. 3,000 feet up the, mount, the, up the side of Mountain Comfort, he rode up the tip-top up to, to, to dump it. Who who to the who's was the Grinch to sit styling. They're just waking up. I just know what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. All the cry, who who. That's a noise, grins the Grinch. I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't said why the sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He started down, he stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes, and he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presents at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming at all. It came. Somehow or another, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled for three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't thought of before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light. And he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he himself had carved the roast feast. And that's it. It's a lovely story. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope that you all get the meaning of the holidays. Um, Christmas, um, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, anything that you might celebrate during this time of year, because it has a lot more meaning than buying things at a store. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everybody. I love you all. Have a great day. Ohio. I'm DJ Wheels or Ken. And I'm Mrs. DJ Wheels or Becky. We would like to say hello to everyone at OPN and thank you especially to Zena who allowed us to share a Christmas story our family has always loved and enjoyed. Hope you will enjoy it as well. Ready? Yep. The 
The Legend of the Christmas Spider. Once, a long, long time ago, a gentle mother was busily cleaning the house for the most wonderful day of the year, Christmas Day. Not a speck of dust was left anywhere. Even the little spiders had vanished from their cozy corner high up on the ceiling to avoid the housewife's busy cleaning. They finally fled to the farthest corner of the forgotten attic. Finally, it was Christmas Eve. The tree was decorated and the children delighted. But the poor spiders were frantic, for they had not seen the tree nor been present for the magic of the season. The oldest and wisest spiders suggested that perhaps they could wait until everyone had gone to bed and then sneak through the crack in the door and see the wonders of the tree. The little spiders silently and carefully came down from their attic corner and across the floor to wait in the crack on the threshold. Pretty soon, all was quiet, so the spiders quickly crept into the room. The tree towered so high that they couldn't see the ornaments on top. In fact, the little spider's eyes were so small that they could only see one ornament at a time. They all scurried up the trunk, out along each branch, filled with happy wonder at the glimmering beauty. The spiders loved the Christmas tree. All night long they danced in the branches, and every place they went left a trail of dusty gray web. When at last they had inspected every bit of the Christmas tree, it was shrouded in the dusty gray of spider webs. Santa smiled as he thought of the happy spiders seeing the tree and how much they liked it. But he also thought of how sad the little mother would be over the dusty tree. He reached out his hand, and just then, the sun came through the window and touched the tree. All the webs started to sparkle and shine, turning into shimmering, sparkling silver and gold. The tree glistened in greater beauty than ever before. Ever since that time, people have hung tinsel on Christmas trees. And according to legend, it has been a custom to include a spider among the decorations of the tree. And, and that's, that's the, the legend, legend of, of the, the Christmas, Christmas spider. The end. Merry Christmas. And, and Happy New Year, OPN. Wave goodbye. And off, wave goodbye. And hand off. Two big eyes peered out from a little face framed by floppy brown speckled ears. The little cocker spaniel rested in the grass beneath the bench on which his master, an old man with a cane, was sitting. Miss, the man said, would you do me a favour and walk my dog around the lake? I have to rest my old bones today. The woman wanted to say, no, my 40-year-old bones are pretty weary too. They had been weary every day for the past year, since last September, when her husband had been killed in a terrorist attack. But then there were those two deep doggy eyes watchfully waiting. Grudgingly, she accepted the leash that was extended to her. The dog leaped up in eager anticipation, as if he'd just been released from prison. He charged ahead with gusto. Soon the dog was taking the woman for a walk, rather than vice versa. The woman was puffing by the time they had circled the lake and returned to the starting bench. There was only one problem, no sign of the dog's owner. She searched and searched to no avail. No one in the park remembered the man. She went to the police station and reported the incident. There was no report of a man of his description missing. The police checked hospitals and even the morgue. Still no sign of the man. What am I supposed to do with him, she asked, pointing an accusing finger at the little dog parked at her feet. Well, you could bring him to the pound, the policeman said. Good idea, she answered. The officer continued, but these days the pound is pretty crowded. She shrugged, but when she looked down, there were those two eyes peering up at her, and so she said, 
Well, I guess I could bring him home for a day or two. A day or two stretched into a week, which soon stretched into a month, then two, then three. The woman and the dog often went for brisk walks around the lake, but there was no sign of the old man. The woman's life had changed considerably. Having to get up early to walk the dog, she could no longer sleep late. Since she had to feed the dog several times a day, she got back into the habit of eating three meals a day, a habit broken since her husband had died. The dog ripped up some of her old clothes and she had to shop for new ones, the first new clothes she had bought in over a year. She needed them because she had met some new friends, fellow dog walkers, and had begun to socialise again. On Christmas Eve, the dog seemed restless as he and the woman circled the lake. He stopped and stared at each person they passed. Several times he scampered into the woods surrounding the lake, sniffing and darting his eyes around at anything and everything. He appeared to be on a search mission. The woman thought it was strange because the dog's mood seemed to be in sharp contrast with her own. She was feeling so much more peaceful these days. She bent down and patted the little dog, trying to calm him down, and she mumbled, He never even told me your name. They stopped for a rest at the bench, where it had all began three months ago. The dog began barking and sniffing at a small scrap of paper stuck to the bench. The woman picked it up and was startled to read, His name is Angel. She looked down at the dog, now resting at her feet. He too had found peace. She thought about the little man with the cane who had given her the dog. He was chubby, with red cheeks. He had said he was tired, but he didn't look it. In fact, he looked quite hale and hearty. She thought about the movie, Miracle on 34th Street. Hmm, she questioned herself. Am I losing it? She tugged at the dog's leash and said, Come on, Angel, we're going home. Angel jumped to attention. She was startled to see that his eyes were gazing upward, not at her, but at something way, way above her. She followed his gaze but saw nothing. As they headed for home, she couldn't help but think that maybe, just maybe, 34th Street didn't have the monopoly on Christmas miracles. There had been at least once in the lake. She quickened her pace. Was there more to come? This is Johnny Greed with his contribution to the OPN Recess Christmas Special, or whatever you want to call it. And I will be reading a Pirate's 12 Days of Christmas book by Philip Yates and illustrated by Sebastian Sarah. It <coughs> was on the eve of Christmas tide, our ship sailed in the night across the dark and briny deep. Beneath the stars so bright. Ahoy, me mates, the captain roared. It's time to plunder wrecks. Except for you, me cabin boy. You'll stay and swab the decks. I told him it was Christmas time. Arr, humbug, Captain Bark. That holiday's for land lovers. You'll stay put on the sark. And here's a picture. Oh, there might be too grainy there. Uh, that's all the pirates leaving. There's the cabin boy stuck on the ship. I'm not going to do that with every picture, I don't think. I'll just describe to you and show one more at the end. That night I dreamed of Christmas trees of sparkling beneath the moon, and Johnny and jolly old Sir Peggotty with sacks full of the blooms. But when I woke, I saw a sight. What's this upon our ship? A vast, I cried, and danced a jig. A song burst from me lips. On the birthday of Christmas, a gift was sent to me. A parrot in a palm tree. 
and in his dreams, he's got eight, eight little seahorses pulling Sir Peggotty's sleigh through the sky. On the second day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, two cutlasses and a parrot in a palm tree. On the third day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, three black cats, two cutlasses and a parrot in a palm tree. On the fourth day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses, and a parrot in a palm tree. On the fifth day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, five chests of gold, four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses, and a parrot in a palm tree. On the sixth day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, six Jolly Rogers, five chests of gold, four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses, and a parrot in a palm tree. On the seventh day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, seven monkeys swinging, six Jolly Rogers, five chests Five chests of gold, four cackling hens, three black cats, two puppies, and a parrot in a palm tree. On the eighth day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, eight dolphins swimming, seven monkeys swinging, six Jolly Rogers, five chests of gold. Four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses, and a parrot in a palm tree. On the ninth day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me. Nine mermaids singing, eight dolphins swimming, seven monkeys swinging, six Jolly Rogers, five chests of gold. Four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses, and a parrot in a palm tree. Excuse me, excuse me while I get some Christmas spirits into me. <clears throat> On the tenth day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me. Ten sloops are sailing, nine mermaids singing, eight dolphins swimming, seven monkeys swinging, six Jolly Rogers, five chests, of gold, four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses, and a parrot in a palm tree. <clears throat> On the eleventh day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me, eleven swallows swooping, ten sloops are sailing, nine mermaids singing, eight dolphins swimming, seven monkeys swinging, six jolly riders, five chests of gold. Four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses, and a parrot in a palm tree. On the twelfth day of Christmas, a gift was sent to me. Twelve pirates cheering, eleven swallows whooping, ten sloops are sailing, nine mermaids singing, eight dolphins swimming, seven monkeys swinging, six Jolly Rogers, five chests of gold. Four cackling hens, three black cats, two cutlasses and a parrot in a palm tree. And so here they have a bunch of signs here. There's, let's see, sea dogs greetings. Greetings, as the pirate would say. And then there's a ahoy to the world. There's another flag here. Have a Jolly Roger Christmas. So it looks like they're having quite the party there on the ship. And the cabin boy and all the pirates are cheering and the monkeys are swinging and the dolphins are swimming. And <clears throat> Surprise me, Bucko shouted. The captain winked at me. Merry Christmas, laddie boy. We sent those gifts to ye. Hooray, the captain cried. It's time for bed. A bath. Anchors away. For jolly old Sir Peggotty will soon be on his sleigh. I thanked me hearty, one and all, for every gift they sent. Then sang a little sleepy song. And this is how it went. On the last night of Christmas, my maidies gave to me 
twelve pirates snoring, eleven swallows roosting, ten sloops are drifting, nine mermaids dreaming, eight dolphins drowsing, seven monkeys dozing, six flags are falling, five beds of gold, four nesting hens, three fat gnats, two sleeping swords. And a parrot a snoozing with me. And that ends our little story here. This a little pirate glossary here. I'll read it and then I can cut it if she likes. A vast is a pirate's way of saying stop or who goes there. Black cats are considered very good luck on board a pirate ship. Bucko, what a pirate calls his or her best friend, Bert the Buccaneer. Christmas time, another name for the Christmas season. Dolphins. Dolphins swimming alongside ships are thought to bring good luck. The Bloom is a Spanish gold coin pirates love to steal. Jolly Roger is the pirate skull and crossbones flag. When it's raised, it's singing is meant to strike fear into the hearts of the pirate's victims. Landlubber is landlubber, or somebody who prefers to stay on land. Maybes and Hardies are pirate shipmates. Plunger, that's what a pirate does when robbing loot from other ships. Sark, short for the black shark, the name of the ship in this book. One of the most famous pirate ships in history was called the Cuddy Sark, which was a sailing ship which was a sailing ship with three masts. Sloop is a small sailboat with a single mast, similar to a dinghy. Swallow. Spotting a swallow means that the land is near and the smooth sailing is ahead. Thar. Sometimes used for there and sometimes for there. Spelled two different ways. And that is it. Merry Christmas, me buckos. Peace. Occupy and Christmas cheer. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Georgia Boy. I want to wish everybody um, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Hanukkah, and uh, to um, to all religions, just peace on earth. Where you you know whether this is your time of year or not, it's 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 everybody's time of year all year long, and uh, just want uh, to wish everyone to be um, happy and and healthy, and uh, take care. <laughs>
Hi, Kiki, Vex's granddaughter, sent me this email, and I want to read it for you all. Hi, Ruby. I attached a photo of Fifi. I wanted to share with OWNN, WZEN, Recess, you actually, for months. Fifi is okay-ish with this cause, and it was a good hair shot. And she is wearing shades. Ha ha ha. She cracks me up. She cracks everyone up all the time. Hi, Ruby, and there's hearts. It's me, Feck. Thank you for reading my story. Murky buckets. Kumbaya time, motherfuckers. Laugh my ass off, tears and tears. Awareness of all varieties. Fellow Occupy Wall Street. Love, peace. Mongering wagers. A great fortune. The luck of you, mi amiga, mi comrad. Much strength and love to you, Alan and Famia. Back to Kiki. Hurry up, Kiki. I gotta get to Gone for the news. Hugs and sunshine for your pocket. Thank you for the cheers, well wishes, and hellos, Fifi passes on. I send many, many thanks. Back to you and yours. You rock. A goat tail. One day during the Christmas season, <clears throat> As in snowbound, family and farm huddled close, cooking the way through the woodpile, a nine-year-old Alice dons her snow leggings and sets out for a mountain wander. Woo-hoo! Two hours of bright, diamond-filled, crisp, fluffy new, slow, new snow. Fun in the sun! At the gate to the back mountain path, Alice hears the twinkle of her goat bells. The sound of her twin brother. Hank doing her feeding chores for her. She pauses, considers going back and helping, but remembers the deal she struck and how she will do Hank's wood carry and splitting later that day. She ponders that Pa will help her with this chore as he dotes on her much already. Never mind, Alex shakes off these thoughts and unlatches the gate. As she turns, Pulling it closed, she sees her mama waving and smiling at her from the upstairs hatch. Alex, Alice waves back, and with a big grin splitting her face, she loops the ancient gate, rope home, safe and secure, and sets off on her hike. It is colder than Alice had thought, and she quickens her step for warmth. A giddy feeling begins as her energy rises. Soon Alice is lost in the mountain path magic, singing out loud, and all the nature singing along with her. Hello, trees. Hello, little snowbirds. I see you. Hello, early babbling brook. I hear you under there. Before Alice knows it, she has reached the narrow meadow plateau above the tree line. She finds a rock. She sits and looks way up on the ice shear to the mountain peak. She looks left and right, taking in the breathtaking 180-degree view the plateau provides. She looks down, way, way down there. The unseen valley bottom, a place she has never been. Valleys that lead to fjords, that lead to the sea level, where people ride ships on oceans. The newspaper photograph clipping Pa puts up on the village post board of such cities, trains, and shipyards, her only reference for modern imagings. Bam! Out of nowhere, Alice is airborne, landing face first into the snow. Dazed, she feels her head. Whew, lucky, no rocks just a nose full of ice. What was that? What happened? Alice looked around. Hank playing tricks? No one, nothing. The plateau is just as peaceful as ever. She gets up, digging snow from her collar. 
It is while looking around for her hat that she notices the goat tracks behind where she was sitting. Ha 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 ha! Two can play at that game, Alice thinks. She sets off following the hoof prints, which lead back down the mountain path. She is barely in the tree line when the tracks stop dead, going nowhere. She looks around. She can see the light from the plateau dancing down the top of the path, and there stands the big old billy goat, gazing at her, her brightly knitted hat laying at his feet. Dang mountain climber tricked her. Alice yells at the billy in order to scare him, get her own back. The goat blinks at her, not moving more than that. She can't tell if he is herd or wild. He has no bell. Alice flaps her arms and dances about silly. Woo, goat, woo, woo, you're a goat, la, 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 woo. The goat appears to find her amusing and does a little prance. Alice goes still. The goat goes still. Alice takes a step forward. The goat takes a step forward. Alice takes another step forward. The goat suddenly changes direction and charges directly at her. She screams and runs, hears him close behind. Alice spots a shadow in the snow and throws her body into a crevice. The goat flies past, ice clumps spewing from his hoofs, followed by the loudest earth and bone shaking boom Alice will ever feel in her life, an avalanche. The goat was saving her life. All these thoughts occur to Alice as fast as it takes for the mountain to throw up, down some heavy ass snow, rocks and ice, approximately 48 seconds. The roaring stops. A type of entombed silence prevails. Alice climbs out of her crevice. Immediately she can tell the avalanche fell away from the village cluster. She looks for birds, spots one flying from branch to branch. A good sign. She turns and looks up the path. The narrow plateau is replaced with a terrifying wall of growling and settling snow. Alice hightails it, running back down the path as fast as she can. Before reaching the gate, her mama, with Hank and Pa behind, is te tearing wildly up the path towards her. A look of the purest relief floods Mama's face as Alice flies into view, which is quickly replaced with one of mirth. Unknown to Alice, the cold, the snow, the running, everything on her is stiff. Her clothing is puffed up with ice, her legging ties, and long hair frozen straight back and out. Hank is pointing and openly laughing. Alice feels at herself, still dazed. Pa moves back towards the house, barking for blankets, barking for Hank to follow, barking his relief with that unique strength that is Ma, that is Pa. Mama kneels, touches Alice's cheek softly, cupping her hands and blowing them hot, laying them on, and then ever so quietly and slowly, over her mama's shoulder, the billy goat's face peers. Alice watches the goat and what her mama is doing. Alice watches the goat watching what her mama is doing, the blowing, the hands warm, and placing them lovingly. He tilts his head peacefully for a better look, gives a nod of approval, and leaps away. Startling Mama, who turns and upon seeing the goat exclaims, Look at that! A three-legged billy! And poof, he is gone. Goats are quick. Mama kisses the tip of Alice's nose. Hank brings up the wood, sled so she can ride home. Pa lays his family heirloom bearskin over her, and she snuggles in, as best as her stiff, unmelting self will allow. Hank smiles at her. She smiles the same back. Three legs, says Hank. I didn't notice that. The chatting lilts, and the voices ringing, different in the avalanche air. Alice, the perfection of true safety, settling around her, breathing and thinking all the while. Ha 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 ha, wonderful wild old billy goat. Game is on. I'll see you tomorrow. Merry, merry, merry wishes, thoughts, prayers, loving Aki waves for you all. All that there is, every day, all week, every street, park, highway, and byway. Get your peace on, peeps. Love, Vekix. A Christmas gift to your enemy, forgiveness, to an opponent, tolerance, to a friend, your heart, to a customer, service, to all, charity.
to every child a good example. To yourself, respect. Happy holidays to all. Twas a night before actions. Twas a night before actions in the Occupy house. All laptops were in use, including the mouse. Actions all planned out to prove that we care. Knowing a Twitter storm would also be there. We know the banksters got bailouts, if in the red. No visions of helping the poor or unfed. There was no chief as they looked at the map. Not one single brain prepared for a nap. Then out on Wall Street there arose such a clatter. From activists arriving to show actions matter. Over there, over here, the cameras did flash. The MSM prepping their sound bites splash. Routes are all marked. We know where to go. Nothing to stop us, not even the snow. Then what to our wondering eyes would appear? A police department hummer with faces full of fear. There was no riot gear, all dressed up slick. All that were present knew this must be a trick. More rapid than eagles, the hummers they came. Activists bristled, shouted, and called them rude names. Now horses, now scooters, all of them mixing. Some came on mopeds, their egos need fixing. Dispersed to each corner, some standing quite tall. Our stolen cash from the one percent paying for it all. While children go hungry and the homeless die, the Wall Street clowns wonder who else to buy. They own the house, both the red and the blue. With the corrupt payments, bills pass easily through. And then amid cheering we look to the roof to see a banner drop by some quite aloof. The message was clear to those on the ground. No disagreeing or dissenting voice could be found. The letters glowed visibly, all of them over a foot. The banner canvas untarnished, no ashes or soot. Then the people's mic started from far in the back. The chant became clear at the front of the pack. The old, young or wrinkled, most of them merry, those dressed up all warm, or costumed like a fairy. Black block moved up front to ward off the blows, as more law enforcement agents continued to show. We are unique in that we care for the poor, with raised voices and actions, and so much more. Was the chant that you heard bouncing off the walls, as people walked out of the shopping malls? Food not bombs were there feeding the hungry. Never once did they ask for the one percent money. Domestic terrorist label didn't really apply. When totaled together, the idea occupy. Although the mood was festive, all new inside, many could soon be taking a police van ride. That would not stop us was clearly understood. There would be those who suffer for ultimate good. When suddenly from my dream I was awoken, as my bong dropped to the floor broken. Not going to get up and clean up the mess, still enjoying my dream, I have to confess. Happy holidays to all. Damn Brett, who's that knocking on Christmas Eve? High above the Arctic Circle in a land of ice and snow, the northern lights shimmer in the night like a curtain of color hanging from the sky. The air is so crisp and clear in this northern place that one Christmas Eve long ago, a boy from Finnmark on his way to Oslo with his ice bear could see smoke curling from a hut far in the distance. He was cold and hungry, so he headed towards it. Far off in another direction, someone else smelled the smoke, and though he couldn't see it, he raced off to tell the others. As the boy from Fidmark made his way toward the hut, 
Kiri was inside feeding the fire that made the smoke that roasted and baked the fine food. Delicious sausages and fish and tasty buns and cake were all laid out on a pine table. Sweet porridge bubbled over the fire and apple cider stayed cool on the windowsill. So why did Kiri jump at every creak in the roof and why did she run to the window when icicle fell into the snow? It was because in Christmas past, on Christmas Eve, trolls came when they smelled the delicious aromas coming from the hut. They would pound on the door until it burst open. They wouldn't leave until they eaten every bit of Christmas Eve meal. No troll invasion this year, Perry's father said. I'm going up the mountain to watch and chase them away. And off he had gone to stop the trouble before it began. So this year, Kiri was alone in the hut when she heard a soft knock at the door. Knock any knock, knock. Someone was out there, but surely it was too polite to be a troll. Kiri went to the door and peeked out. There was the boy from Finmark with his ice bear. Please let me inside to warm up, he said. I'm on my way south to show off my bear for the townsfolk of Oslo. I have many frosty miles behind me and many more to go. Come in, said Kiri. But I have to warn you that in years past, our house has been invaded by a pack of hungry trolls. Trolls would be a good adventure, a welcome adventure, the boy said. <laughs> so he came in, and the ice bear crawled over the warm stove and fell asleep. When all was quiet, Kiri and the boy sat down in front of the fire again. Kiri got to thinking, I wonder if the porridge is creamy enough, and she ladled a bit out into bowls for each of them. They had just raised their bowls when they heard a loud, knock, knock, knock. It was as if someone was pounding on the door with a big rock. <laughs> Not at home, the boy from Finmark shouted, and he ran to lock the windows. It was quiet again, but the delicious smells wafted around the hut. Here he got to thinking, is the sausage salty enough? She took a piece for her and gave one to the boy. They had just raised their forks when they heard a thunderous knockity knock knock. The door hut shook and they heard a loud crack. It was the cellar trap door splintering open. Harry and the boy ran into the animal shed and pulled the door shut just as a torrent of noisy trolls burst up from the cellar. There were bat-eared trolls, there were bug-nosed trolls, and each troll was wilder and more ruckus than the one before. They munched and grunted, shrieked and tackled, splashed the apple cider, and crammed themselves with Christmas cake. Then, tumbled about, pinching each other, stomping on one another's toes, and tweaking their long snouts, which is how trolls have a good time. But through the ruckus and din, the littlest troll spied the ice bear under the stove. He took a hot morsel morsel of sausage he had been roasting in the fire and screeched, Have a bite of sausage, kitty! And he poked the sleeping bear's nose with it. The ice bear leaped up with a tremendous roar, his nose burning terribly. Growling, he chased the little troll and all the big trolls around the table, up the walls and out the window. The boy shouted, Scratch him, kitty! Gary and the boy cheered as they watched the troll scramble off through the ice and snow, howling. Howling up the hill, Kiri's father heard the shout, so he raced down on his key, skis. When he saw the trolls, Kiri's father could tell in an instant that they wanted to be as far away from that little hut as they could be. Goodbye, trolls, he shouted as they disappeared up the mountain, and he skied home. What a fine bear you have there, he told the boy from Finmark. Thank you for scaring away those pesky trolls. You must come back next year for a real Christmas Eve feast on your way home from Oslo. And they sat down for some porridge. A year later, Kiri was on the mountain gathering in the wood to make the fire to cook the dinner for Christmas Eve. 
when the littlest troll popped out from behind a snowman, saying, Missy, he called in a high, crackly voice. Do you still have that kitty that sleeps under the stove? Oh, yes, Kitty said. Only she has grown up into a big cat now. And she has seven kittens, all larger and fiercer than herself. Ah! He squeaked. Then we won't be visiting your house on Christmas Eve. And he disappeared into the huge snowdrift. And that's the story. I love the fact, I love her trolls. They're incredibly beautiful. Uh, I like when the boy says, a troll would be a welcome adventure. That'd be me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, guys. Enjoy. Hey, good morning, everybody. I was honored to uh, read Feck's story. It was great fun. And um, I really just want to say happy holidays. Uh, as most of you know, it's my 25th wedding anniversary on Christmas. And I wanted to say a special... Love you to my husband, Alan, 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 or sometimes known as Steve. Um, uh, it's been quite a ride with all of you guys. And I just wanted to tell you that I appreciate your friendship and your support. Um, I, think we, uh, I think we do the best we can. And um, I hope everyone has a lovely holiday. And uh, no matter what you are or who you are or what you believe, it's... Um, it's a time for reflection and for friends and for family. And I love you all. Thank you. Bye. One, two, three, go. We lost the snow reindeer. Or where shall we go? If you ever saw it, you wouldn't say it goes. All of the other reindeer used to laugh and call their names. They never let poor Rudolph join in any reindeer games. And when one foggy Christmas Eve, St. Walter came to say, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you come my sleigh tonight? And how the reindeer loved him as they shout out with glee. Rudolph the red no reindeer, you'll go down and hear story. Yay! Thank you. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealings implied. Three times Stella counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven cents, and the next day would be Christmas. It was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did, which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at $8 per week. It did not exactly bear a description, but it certainly had the word on the lookout for the Mendes Dancity squad. In the vestibule below was a letterbox into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to 20 so they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D, 
But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim, and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at the gray cat walking on a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas, and she had only $1.87 with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. $20 a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only a dollar eighty seven to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many happy hours she had spent planning for something nice for him. Something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit near to be worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you've seen a pier glass in an eight dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, but by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall its full length. Now there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. As the Queen of Sheba lives in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like the cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knees and made itself almost a garment for her. And when she did it up again nervously and quickly, once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet, on went her old brown jacket. On with her old brown head. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Mademoiselle Fonet, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della rang and collected herself panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked at the sofroni. Will you buy my hair? asked Ella. I buy hair, said Madame. Take off your hat and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, listing the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, in the next two hours trip by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It truly had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any other store, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum bob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meticulous ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew it must be Jim's. It was like him, quietness and value. The description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly, on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Jelly reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love. Which is always a tremendous task, dear friend, a mammoth task. Within forty minutes her head was covered with tiny close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. 
She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chor chorus girl. What could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his steps on the stairway down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit for saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Please, God. Make him think I'm still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow. He was only 22 and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della and there was an expression in them that she could not read and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with the peculiar expression on his face. Della wiggled off the table and went for him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful night's gift I got for you. You cut off your hair? asked Jim laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact, yet even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked around the room curiously. You say your hair is gone, he said, with an air almost of idiocy. You needn't look for it, said Della. It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone too. It's Christmas Eve, boy, be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs on my head were numbered, she went on with sudden sweetness, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della for ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other's direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year, what's the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat and threw it on the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going for a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string in the paper. Then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the Lord of the flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in the Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear and the beautifully vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leapt up like a singed cat and cried, Oh, oh, Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with the reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. 
Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, said he, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. O oh, all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. The, the Polar, Polar Express, Express by, by Chris Van, Van Allsburg. On Christmas Day, many years ago, I lay in my bed. I did not rustle the sheets. I breathed slowly and silently. I was listening for a sound, a sound a friend told me I'd never hear. The ringing bells of Santa's sleigh. There is no Santa, my friend had insisted, but I knew he was wrong. Late that night, I did hear the sound. I did hear sounds, but it was not ringing bells. From outside came the sound of a hissing steam and squeaking metal. I looked through the window and saw a train standing perfectly still in front of my house. It was wrapped in an apron of steam. Snowflakes fell lightly around it. A conductor stood at the open door of one of the cars. He took a large pocket watch from his vest, then looked up at my window. I put on my slippers and robe. I tiptoed downstairs and out the door. All aboard, the conductor cried out. I ran up to him. Well, he said, are you coming? Where? I asked. Why, to the North Pole, of course, was his answer. This is the Polar Express. I took his outstretched hand, and he pulled me aboard. The train was filled with other children, all in their pajamas and nightgowns. We sang Christmas carols and ate candies with nougat centers as white as snow. We drank hot cocoa as thick and rich as melted chocolate bars. Outside, the lights of the town and the villages flickered in the distance as the Polar Express raced northward. Soon there were no more lights to be seen. We traveled through the cold, dark forest, where lean wolves roamed and white-tailed rabbits hid from our train as it thundered through the quiet wilderness. We climbed mountains so high it seemed as if we could scrape the moon, but the Polar Express never slowed down. Faster and faster we ran along, rolling over peaks and through valleys like a car on a roller coaster. The mountains turned into hills. The hills turned to snow-covered plains. We crossed a barren desert of ice, the great polar ice cap. Lights appeared in the distance. They looked like the lights of a strange ocean liner sailing on a frozen sea. There, said the conductor, is the North Pole. The North Pole. It was a huge city standing alone at the top of the world, filled with factories where every Christmas toy was made. At first we saw no elves. They're gathering in the center of the city, the conductor told us. That is where Santa will give the first gift of Christmas. Who receives the first gift of Christmas, we all asked. The conductor answered, He will choose one of you. Look, shouted one of the children, the elves. Outside we saw hundreds of elves. As our train drew closer to the center of the pole, we slowed to a crawl. So crowded were the streets with Santa's helpers. When the Polar Express could go no further, we stopped and the conductor let us out. We pressed through the crowd to the edge of a large open circle. In front of us stood Santa's sleigh. The reindeer were excited. They pranced and paced, ringing the silver sleigh bells that hung around their harnesses. 
It was a magical sound, like nothing I had ever heard. Across the circle, the elves moved apart and Santa Claus appeared. The elves cheered wildly. He marched over to us and pointed to me, said, Let's have this fellow here. He jumped into his sleigh. The conductor handed, handed me up. I sat on Santa's knee, and he asked, Now what would you like for Christmas? I knew that I could, <clears throat> I could have any gift I could imagine, but the thing I wanted most for Christmas was not inside Santa's giant bag. What I wanted more than anything was one silver bell from Santa's sleigh. When I asked, Santa smiled. Then he gave me a hug and told me an elf told an elf to cut a bell from reindeer's harness. The elf tossed it up to Santa. He stood holding the bell high above him and called out, The first gift of Christmas. A clock struck midnight as the elves roared their approval. Santa handed the bell to me, and I put it on my... I put it in my bathrobe pocket. The conductor helped me down from the sleigh. Santa shouted out the reindeer's names and cracked his whip. His team charged for forward and climbed into the air. Santa circled above us, then disappeared into the cold, dark polar sky. As soon as we were back inside the Polar Express, the other children asked to see the bell. I reached into my pocket, but the only thing I felt was a hole. I had lost the silver bell from Santa Claus's sleigh. Let's hurry outside and look for it, one of the children said. But the train gave a sudden lurch and started moving. We were on our way home. It broke my heart to lose the bell. When the train reached my house, I sadly left the other children. I stood at my doorway and waved goodbye. The conductor said, something from the moving train, but I couldn't hear him. What? I yelled out. He cupped his hands around his mouth. Merry Christmas, he shouted. The Polar Express let out a loud blast from its whistle and sped away. On Christmas morning, my little sister Sarah and I opened our presents. When it looked as if everything had been unwrapped, Sarah found one last box behind the tree. It had my name on it, Inside was the silver bell. There was a note. Found this on the seat of my sleigh. Fix that hole in your pocket. Signed, Mr. C. I shook the bell. It made the most beautiful sound my sister and I had ever heard. But my mother said, Oh, that's too bad. Yes, said my father. It's broken. When I'd shaken the bell, my parents had not heard a sound. At one time, most of my friends could hear the bell. But as years passed, it fell silent for all of them. Even Sarah found one Christmas that she could no longer hear its sweet sound. Though I've grown old, the bell still rings for me, as it does for all who truly believe. The End This is a Junkie's Christmas by William S. Burroughs. Twas Christmas Day, and Danny, the car wiper, hit the street, junk sick and broke after 72 hours in the precinct jail. It was a clear, bright day, but there was no warmth in the sun. Danny shivered with an inner cold. He turned up the collar of his worn, greasy black overcoat. This beat Benny wouldn't pawn for a deuce, he thought. He was in the West 90s, a long block of brownstone rooming houses. Here and there, a holly wreath and a clean black window. Danny's senses registered everything, sharp and clear, with painful intensity and junk sickness. The light hurt his dilated eyes. 
He walked past a car, darting his pale blue eyes sideways in quick appraisal. There was a package on the seat, and one of the ventilator windows was unlocked. Danny walked on ten feet, no one in sight. He snapped his fingers and went through a pantomime of remembering something and wheeled around. No one. A bad setup, he decided. The street being empty like this, I stand out, conspicuous. Gotta make it fast. He reached for the ventilator window. A door opened behind him. Danny whipped out a rag and began polishing the car windows. He could feel the man standing behind him. What you doing? Danny turned as if surprised. Just thought your car windows needed polishing, mister. The man had a frog face and a deep south accent. He was wearing a camel's hair overcoat. My car don't need polishing nor nothing stole out of it neither. Danny slid sideways as the man grabbed for him. I wasn't looking to steal nothing, mister. I'm from the south too, Florida. Goddamn sneaking thief. Danny walked away fast and turned a corner. Better get out of the neighborhood, that hick is likely to call the law. He walked 15 blocks. Sweat ran down his body. There was an ink in his lungs. His lips drew back off his yellow teeth in a snarl of desperation. I got a score somehow. If I had some decent clothes. Danny saw a suitcase standing in a doorway. Good weather. He stopped and pretended to look for a cigarette. Funny, he thought. No one around. Inside, maybe, phoning for a cab. The corner was only a few houses. Danny took a deep breath and picked up the suitcase. He made the corner. Another block. Another corner. The case was heavy. I got a score here, all right, he thought. Maybe enough for a sixteenth in a room. Danny shivered and twitched feeling a warm room and heroin emptying into his vein. Let's have a quick look. He opened the suitcase. Two long packages in brown paper. He took one out. It felt like meat. He tore the package open one end, revealing a woman's naked foot. The toenails were painted with purple-red polish. He dropped the leg with a sneer of disgust. Holy Jesus, he exclaimed. The routines people put down these days. Legs. Well, I got a case anyway. He dumped the other leg out. No blood stains. He snapped the case shut and walked away. Legs, he muttered. He found the buyer sitting at a table in Jero's cafeteria. Thought you might be taking the day off, Danny said, putting the case down. The buyer shook his head sadly. I got nobody, so what's Christmas to me? His eyes traveled over the case, poking, testing, looking for flaws. What was in it? Nothing. What's the matter? I don't pay enough? I tell you, there was nothing in it. Okay, so somebody travels with an empty suitcase. Okay. He held up three fingers. For Christ's sake, give me, give me a nickel. You got somebody else? Why don't he give you a nickel? It's like I say, the case was empty. Gibby kicked at the case despairingly. It's all nicked up and kind of dirty looking, he sniffed suspiciously. How come it stink like that? Mexican leather? So, am I in the leather business? Gibby shrugged. Could be. He pulled out a roll of bills and peeled off three ones, dropping them on the table behind the napkin dispenser. You want? Okay. Danny picked up the money. You see George the Greek, he asked. Where you been? He got busted two days ago. Oh, that's bad. Danny walked out. Now, where can I score, he thought. George the Greek had lasted so long, Danny thought of him as permanent. It was good H, too, and no short counts. Danny went up to 103rd and Broadway. Nobody in Jarrow's. Nobody in the Automat. Yeah, he snarled. All the pushers off on the nod someplace. What they care about anybody else, so long as they got it in the vein. What do they care about a sick junkie? He wiped his nose with one finger, looking around furtively. No use hitting those jigs in Harlem. Like as not get beat for my money or they slip me a rat poison. Might find Panda Pong Rose at 8th and 23rd. There was nobody he knew at 23rd Street Thompson's. Jesus, he thought, where is everybody? 
He clutched his coat collar together with one hand, looking up and down the street. There's Joey from Brooklyn. I'd know that hat anywhere. Joey was walking away with his back to Danny. He turned around. His face was sunken, skull-like. The gray eyes glittered under a greasy felt hat. Joey was sniffing at regular intervals, and his eyes were watering. No use asking him, Danny thought. They looked at each other with the hatred of disappointment. Guess you heard about George the Greek, Danny said. Yeah, I heard. You been up to 103rd? Yeah, just came from there, nobody around. Nobody around any place, Joey said. I can't even score for goofballs. Well, Merry Christmas, Joey. See ya. Yeah, see you. Danny was walking fast. He had remembered a croaker on 18th Street. Of course, the croaker had told him not to come back. Still, it was worth trying. A brownstone house with a card in the window. P.H. Zuniga, M.D. Danny rang the bell. He heard slow steps. The door opened, and the doctor looked at Danny with bloodshot brown eyes. He was weaving slightly and supported his plump body against the door jamb. His face was smooth, Latin, the little red mouth slack. He said nothing. He just leaned there, looking at Danny. Goddamned alcoholic, Danny thought. He smiled. Merry Christmas, doctor. The doctor did not reply. You remember me, doctor. Danny tried to edge past the doctor into the house. I'm sorry to trouble you on Christmas Day, but I, I've suffered another attack. Attack? Yes, facial neurologia. Danny twisted one side of his face into a horrible grimace. The doctor recoiled slightly, and Danny pushed into the dark hallway. Better shut the door or you'll be catching cold, he said jovially, shoving the door shut. The doctor looked at him, his eyes focusing visibly. I can't give you a prescription, he said. But doctor, this is a legitimate condition, an emergency, you understand. No prescription, impossible. It's against the law. You took an oath, doctor. I'm in agony. Danny's voice shot up to a hysterical grating whine. The doctor winced and passed a hand over his forehead. Let me think. I can give you a one quarter grain tablet. That's all I have in the house. But doctor, a quarter, the doctor stopped him. If your condition is legitimate, you will not need more. If it isn't, I don't want anything to do with you. Wait right here. The doctor weaved down the hall, leaving a wake of alcoholic breath. He came back and dropped a tablet into Danny's hand. Danny wrapped the tablet in a piece of paper and tucked it away. There is no charge, the doctor put his hand on the doorknob. And now, my dear, but doctor, can't you object to the minification? No, you will obtain longer relief using orally. Please, not to return. The doctor opened the door. Well, this will take the edge off. And I still have money put down on a room, Danny thought. He knew a drugstore had sold needles without question. He bought a 26-gauge insulin needle and an eyedropper, which he selected carefully, rejecting models with a curved dropper or a thick end. Finally, he bought the baby pacifier to use instead of the bulb. He stopped in the automat and stole a teaspoon. Danny put down two dollars on a six dollar a week room in the West Forties, where he knew the landlord. He bolted the door and put a spoon, needle, and dropper on a table by the bed. He dropped the tablet and the spoon and covered it with a dropper full of water. He held a match under the spoon until the tablet dissolved. He tore a strip of paper, wet it, and wrapped it around one end of the dropper, fitting the needle over the wet paper to make an airtight connection. He dropped a piece of lint from his pocket into the spoon and sucked the liquid into the dropper through the needle, holding the needle into the lint to take up the last drop. Danny's hands trembled with excitement and his breath was quick. With a shot in front of him, his defenses gave way and junk sickness flooded his body. His legs began to twitch and ache. A cramp stirred in his stomach. Tears ran down his face from his smarting, burning eyes. He wrapped a handkerchief around his right arm, holding the end in his teeth. He tucked the handkerchief in and began rubbing his arm to bring out a vein. Guess I can hit that one, he thought, running one finger along a vein. He picked up the dropper in his left hand. Danny heard a groan from the next room. He frowned with annoyance. Another groan. He could not help listening. He walked across the room, the dropper in his hand, and inclined his ear to the wall. 
The groans were coming at regular intervals, a horrible, inhuman sound pushed out from the stomach. Danny listened for a full minute. He returned to the bed and sat down. Why don't someone call a doctor, he thought indignantly. It's a bring down. He straightened his arm and poised the needle. He tilted his head, listening again. Oh, for Christ's sake, he tore off the handkerchief and placed the dropper in a water glass, which he hid behind the wastebasket. He stepped into the hall and knocked on the door of the next room. There was no answer. The groans continued. Danny tried the door. It was open. The shade was up and the room was full of light. He had expected an old person somehow, but the man on the bed was very young, 18 or 20, fully clothed and doubled up with his hands clasped across his stomach. What's wrong, kid? Danny asked. The boy looked at him, his eyes blank with pain. Finally got one word, kidneys. Kidney stones? Danny smiled. I don't mean it's funny, kid. It's just I've faked it so many times. Never saw the real thing before. I'll call an ambulance. The boy bit his lip. Won't come. Doctors won't come. The boy hid his face in the pillow. Danny nodded. They figure it's just another junkie throwing a wing ding for a shot. But your case is legit. Maybe if I went to the hospital and explained things. No, I guess that wouldn't be so good. Don't live here, the boy said. They say I'm not entitled. Yeah, I know how they are, the bureaucrat bastards. I had a friend once, died a snake bite right in the waiting room. They wouldn't even listen when he tried to explain a snake bit him. He never had enough moxie. That was 15 years ago down in Jacksonville. Danny trailed off. Suddenly put out his thin, dirty hand and touched the boy's shoulder. I, I'm sorry, kid. You wait, I'll fix you up. He went back to his room and got the dropper and returned to the boy's room. Roll up your sleeve, kid. The boy fumbled his coat sleeve with a weak hand. That's okay, I'll get it. Danny undid the shirt button at the wrist and pushed the shirt and coat up, bearing a thin brown forearm. Danny hesitated, looking at the dropper. Sweat ran down his nose. The boy was looking up at him. Danny shoved the needle into the boy's forearm and watched the liquid drain into the flesh. He straightened up. The boy lay down, stretching. I feel real sleepy. Didn't sleep all last night. His eyes were closing. Danny walked across the room and pulled the shade down. He went back to his room and closed the door without locking it. He sat on the bed, looking at the empty dropper. It was getting dark outside. Danny's body ached for junk. But it was a dull ache now, dull and hopeless. Numbly, he took the needle of the dropper and wrapped it in a piece of paper. Then he wrapped the needle and dropper together. He sat there with the package in his hand. Got a stash this someplace, he thought. Suddenly a warm flood pulsed through his veins and broke in his head like a thousand golden speedballs. For Christ's sake, Danny thought. I must have scored the immaculate fix. The vegetable serenity of junk settled in his tissues. His face went slack and peaceful, and his head fell forward. Danny the car wiper was on the nod. Hello, OW Nurse, Opian Nurse, Activist World Nurse, Hola, familia, 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 family. That's what we all are. And uh, uh, this is your amigo. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, I'm improvising and I'm doing it as of now. I didn't write anything. I just uh, wanted to express, uh, uh, to say something about uh, this uh, ho uh, holiday season um, and, the, and I even have my chronometer here because I'm recording this on the studio so I'll be trying to be as short as, uh, as fast as possible and uh, 
Okay, so here it is. Um, this season, uh, for me, this is my own feeling, feelings about uh, this uh, December and all that surrounds Christmas, and not only Christmas, but uh, um, and not only religious uh, seasons and uh, also um, Valentine's Day and, and so many other days that uh, I, I'm sure most of you know that uh, there's a day of everything, even at the, of the toilet day. There's a, an international day of the toilet. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I'm not uh, diminishing the importance of the of uh, these uh, uh, the people uh, this belief this uh, belief that uh, Christ came uh, to save the world and uh, all and to die for our sins and all the people who believe in that I totally respect them and uh, and of course people that don't I also do respect just as well and uh, myself I used to believe uh, I used to be I was born and raised as a Catholic and uh, then I become I became a born-again Christian then I was uh, into Buddhism and then until on a little bit a little bit of the Dianet Dianetics Uh, by L. M. Uh, Hubert and uh, what have you? I've been, uh, I mean, I've been in too many uh, types of uh, beliefs, and I ended up uh, in my own uh, very intimate uh, belief on what is it about or why we are here, or who is there, is there a life after that, death, and all of that. My point is, uh, as I've said, this is my, my personal feelings on this, and I do want to express that. Uh, I've said it ma many times, uh, I believe, uh, Probably some of you have heard me say it, just a few, but I've, I've, I've said it repeatedly. That uh, for me, yesterday's gone, tomorrow has never existed. I mean, uh, if, 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 you know, it, it doesn't exist tomorrow because the, we only have today. And the importance of every day, even, even in my own opinion, for any religious person must live as if Christ was born every single day. Not only at a season where somebody said he was born, you know, or he died or was sacrificed. And um, just as well as every day we should celebrate life We should celebrate that uh, what that how fortunate we are, uh, and it's easy for us uh, to to be aware of that because we we see every day we dedicate ourselves to inform ourselves and to inform others on what's happening around the world. So, I believe that. Most of us, most of us are very fortunate because we are not in that situation. Uh, many of us have uh, illnesses. Many of us have uh, so many issues, but what keeps us together is the common, our, uh, our common views are, are on many things are, and our need to To, to be loved and to love and to be heard and to and to be accepted and to 
to to to laugh with somebody to be in touch and and uh, to be touched in your heart in your mind and uh, I believe we do that uh, in many ways and uh, for those who celebrate uh, Christmas um, in the way it should be Merry Christmas I really from the bottom of my heart I really hope you have a very merry 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 Christmas and uh, for those that don't follow it uh, I do wish from the bottom of my heart that you have a merry 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 day today because I don't even know if I'm gonna make it to Christmas <laughs> you know if anybody if, you know but Anyway, I'm, I'm simp. As I've said, I'm a simple man. I don't, I didn't write anything. I just wanted to say this: that every day that we see each other, uh, let's. I or at least I believe. I'm not sure, and I don't want to think. I don't want to worry about tomorrow. Everything we're doing, of course, has to do with things. In order uh, for them to change the the wrong. Uh, into good for next right generations, etc. And that's that's what we're doing. Yes, but we're doing it today. And uh, it's very important to think about that. That uh, today is what we have. And so there's a lot of uh, people that are alone, that uh, physically are alone don't have any close families or friends to go visit or to be visited by and uh, to any of you uh, to those of you I say that uh, hey you're not alone you're really not alone first of all you have yourself you have yourself and then you have so many other things And plus, uh, you have an amigo uh, through the internet uh, from from Mexico, far away. We communicate through this media, but uh, you know me, and I speak from the heart when I say I love you, and I understand why people get depressed. This and this also a type of. Uh, Uh, consumerism and you know and all of this but uh, you know uh, I take it as, uh, as, as in a different way as, as I do every day I try to take the most of every day every, everything I can do that today I do it that's why I decided to do this <laughs> and I Uh, of course, because uh, Zena uh, didn't, uh, uh, she said she needed it uh, for this weekend. So, uh, since I have a lot of things to do also, uh, and I thought uh, the most fresh way to do it is not is to to improvise, to just speak out and uh, and uh, and say what I what I really feel, what I think. And uh, I guess I did it. <laughs> and um, so to end this up, I have uh, 10 uh, minutes now <laughs> and 14 seconds. And uh, this is it. I thought it was going to be shorter. I would have loved to say more things, but I don't want this to be, I want this to be a short thing. So I love, I really love you all. And uh, we have shown each other with actions that we feel really uh, as families. We are not like a family. We are a family. Okay? So, have a merry, 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 merry day today. I love you, your amigo, over and pass.
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be reading a short story by Charles Dickens called What Christmas Is As We Grow Older. And I know Christmas, is, I mean, not Christmas. Dickens is really hard to understand, I think, because sometimes his sentences go on for four paragraphs. So I put the link in here so you can follow along if you want. I just posted it up there. And this story um, from Dickens is about adults who should return to the ways we celebrated Christmas as children. And it was originally published in 1851. What Christmas is as we grow older. Time was with most of us when Christmas Day, encircling all our limited world like a magic ring, left nothing out for us to miss or seek found together all our home enjoyments, affections, and hopes, grouped everything and everyone around the Christmas fire, and made the little picture shining in our bright young eyes complete. Time came, perhaps, all so soon, when our thoughts overleaped that narrow boundary, when there was someone, very dear, we thought then, very beautiful and absolutely perfect, wanting to the fullness of our happiness, when we were wanting to, or we thought so, which did just as well, at the Christmas hearth by which someone sat, and when we intertwined with every wreath and garland of our life that someone's name. That was the time for bright visionary Christmases, which have long arisen from us to show faintly, after summer rain, in the palest edges of the rainbow. That was the time for the beatified enjoyment of the things that were to be, and never were, and yet the things that were so real in our resolute hope that it would be hard to say now what realities achieved since have been stronger. What? Did that Christmas never really come when we and the priceless pearl who was our young choice were received after the happiest of totally impossible marriages by the two united families previously at daggers drawn on our account? When brothers and sisters-in-laws who had always been rather cool to us before our relationship was affected perfectly doted on us, and when fathers and mothers overwhelmed us with unlimited incomes, was that Christmas dinner never really eaten, after which we arose and generously and eloquently rendered honor to our late rival, present in the company, then and there exchanging friendship and forgiveness, and founding an attachment not to be surpassed in Greek or Roman story, which, subsided, which subsisted until death? Has that same rival long ceased to care for the same priceless pearl and marry for money and become usurious? Above all, do we really know now that we should probably have been miserable if we had won and worn the pearl, and that we are better without her? That Christmas, when we had recently achieved so much fame, when we had been carried in triumph somewhere for doing something great and good, when we had won an honored and ennobled name, and arrived and were received at home in a shower of tears of joy, is it possible that that Christmas has not come yet? And is our life here, at the best, so constituted that, pausing as we advance at such a noticeable milestone in the track as this great birthday, we look back on the things that never were, as naturally and full as gravely as on the things that have been and are gone, or have been and still are? If it be so, and so it seems to be, must we come to the conclusion that life is little better than a dream and little worth the loves and strivings that we crowd into it? No. Far be such miscalled philosophy from us, dear reader, on Christmas Day. Nearer and closer to our hearts be the Christmas spirit, which is the spirit of actful usefulness, perseverance, cheerful discharge of duty, kindness, and forbearance. It is in the last virtues especially that we are or should be strengthened by the unaccomplished visions of our youth. For who shall say that they are not our teachers to deal gently, even with the impalpable nothings of the earth? Therefore, as we grow older, let us be more thankful that the circle of our Christmas associations and of the lessons that they bring expands. Let us welcome every one of them and summon them to take their places by the Christmas hearth. Welcome, old aspirations, glittering creatures of an ardent fancy, to your shelter underneath the holly. We know you and have not outlived you yet. Welcome, old projects and old loves, however fleeting, to your nooks among the steadier lights that burn around us. Welcome all that was ever real to our hearts, and for the earnestness that made you real, thanks to heaven. Do we build no Christmas castles in the clouds now? 
Let our thoughts, fluttering like butterflies among these flowers of children, bear witness. Before this boy, there stretches out a future, brighter than we ever looked on in our old romantic time, but bright with honor and with truth. Around this little head on which the sunny curls lie heaped, the graces sport as prettily, as airily, as when there was no sieve, within the, time of, within the reach of time to shear away the curls of our first love. Upon another girl's face near it, placider but smiling bright, a quiet and, a quiet and contented little face, we see home fairly written. Shining from the word, as rays shine from a star, we see how, when our graves are old, other hopes than ours are young, other hearts than ours are moved, how other ways are smooth, how other happiness blooms, ripens, and decays. No, not decays, for other homes and other bands of children, not yet in being, nor for ages yet to be, arise and bloom and ripen to the end of all. Welcome everything. Welcome alike what has been and what never was and what we hope may be. To your shelter underneath the holly, to your places round the Christmas fire, where what is sits open-hearted. Where what is sits open-hearted. In yonder shadow do we see obtruding furtively upon the blaze an enemy's face? By Christmas Day we do forgive him. If the injury he has done us may admit of such companionship, let him come here and take his place. If otherwise, unhappily, let him go hence, assured that he will never injure nor accuse him. On this day we shout nothing. Pause, says a low voice. Nothing? Think. On Christmas Day we shall shout from our fireside nothing. Not the shadow of a vast city where the withered leaves are lying deep, the voice replies. Not the shadow that darkens the whole globe. Not the shadow of the city of the dead. Not even that. Of all days in the year, we will turn our faces toward that city upon Christmas Day and from its silent hosts bring those we loved among us. City of the dead, in the blessed name wherein we are gathered together in this time and in the presence that is here among us, according to the promise, we will receive and not dismiss thy people who are dear to us. Yes, we can look upon these children angels that alight so solemnly, so beautifully among the living children by the fire and can bear to think how they departed from us. Entertaining angels unawares, as the patriarchs did, the playful children are unconscious of their guests. But we can see them, can see a radiant arm around one favorite neck, as if they were attempting of that child away. Among the celestial figures there is one, a poor misshapen boy on earth, of a glorious beauty now, of whom his dying mother said it grieved her much to leave him here alone for so many years, as it was likely would elapse before he came to her, being such a little child. But he went quickly and was laid upon her breast, and in her hand she leads him. There was a gallant boy who fell far away upon a burning sand beneath a burning sun and said, tell, him at, tell them at home with my last love how much I could have wished to kiss them once, but that I died contented and had done my duty. For there was another over whom they read the words, Therefore we commit his body to the deep, and so consigned him to the lonely ocean and sailed on. Or there was another who lay down to his rest in the dark shadow of great forests, and on earth awoke no more. Oh, shall they not from sand and sea and forest be brought home at such time? There was a dear girl, almost a woman, never to be one, who made a morning Christmas in a house of joy and went her trackless way to the silent city. Do we recollect her, worn out, faintly whispering what could not be heard, and falling into the last sleep for weariness? Oh, look upon her now. Oh, look upon her beauty, her serenity, her changeless youth, her happiness. The daughter of Jairus was recalled to life, to die. But she, more blessed, has heard the same voice saying unto her, Arise forever. We had a friend who was our friend from early days with whom we often pictured the changes that were to come upon our lives and merrily imagined how we would speak and walk and think and talk when we came to be old. His destined habitation in the city of the dead received him in his prime. Shall he be shut out from our Christmas remembrance? Would his love have so excluded us? Lost friend, lost child, lost parent, sister, brother, husband, wife, we will not so discard you. You shall hold your cherished places in our Christmas hearts and by our Christmas fires, 
and in the season of immortal hope and on the birthday of immortal mercy, we shall shout out nothing. The winter sun goes down over town and village. On the sea it makes a rosy path, as if the sacred tread were fresh upon the water. A few more moments and it sinks, and night comes on, and lights begin to sparkle in the prospect. On the hillside, beyond the shapelessly diffused town, and in the quiet keeping of the trees that gird, gird the village steeple, remembrances are cut in stone, planted in common flowers, growing in grass, entwined with lowly brambles around many a mound of earth. In town and village, there are doors and windows closed against the weather. There are flaming logs heaped high. There are joyful faces. There is healthy musical voices. <clears throat> Be all in gentleness and harm excluded from the temples of the household gods, but be those remembrances admitted with tender encouragement. They are of the time in all its comforting and peaceful reinsur reassurances, and of the history that reunited even upon earth the living and the dead, and of the broad beneficence and goodness that too many men have tried to tear to narrow shreds. The end. Merry Christmas, fine people. This is Clearly, and I do hope you have a happy one. I wanted to take a minute to think back on the people that have helped make our Christmases in the past. And I found this poem online, and I'd like to read it to you. It's called Missing You at Christmas. Every day without you since you had to go is like summer without sunshine and Christmas without snow. I wish that I could talk to you. There's so much I would say. Life has changed so very much since you went away. I miss the bond between us and I miss your kind support. You're in my mind and in my heart and every Christmas thought. I'll always feel you close to me, and though you're far from sight, I'll search for you among the stars that shine on Christmas night. Thank you. This is a poem entitled December 26th by Ken Nesbitt. A BB gun, a model plane, a basketball, electric train, a bicycle, a cowboy hat, a comic book, a baseball bat, a deck of cards, a science kit, a racing car, a catcher's mitt. So that's my list of everything the Santa Claus forgot to bring. "'Twas the night before Christmas went all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Stockings were hung by the chimney with hair, in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. And what should my wandering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer? With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his courses they came and whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. 
And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and prying of a little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump. A right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him, in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and then filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying a finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Good night and Merry Christmas to all. That's a wrap.